Welcome to a new episode of Arbitration Life. I am Janet Brin. And I'm Hannah Dumas. Today marks the start of season two of Arbitration Life. Yes, episode one of season two, and we are extremely excited. In our first season, we spoke to arbitrators, counsel, as well as professors based all over the world, from Hong Kong, Jamaica, the United Kingdom, Japan, the US, Spain, New Zealand, to the BVI. We also took Arbitration Life on the road to Paris. <laughs> yes, season one was quite thrilling. We truly got an insight into our guests' lives, both professionally in their career and on a personal level. We were able to share in life experiences, acknowledging and overcoming failures and celebrating the wins and learn so much about their respective arbitration lives. Agreed. The BBI IAC also shared in wins of 2021. We hosted our fourth arbitration week and published our new arbitration rules. Congratulations to Hannah on all that hard work and the rest of the team that worked on it. So all of that done in the same month, the 2021 BBIC arbitration rules include new provisions for emergency arbitrator proceedings, expedited procedures, tribunal, secretaries, joinder, and consolidation. Absolutely. And some other new provisions are in the 2021 rules are the result of a comprehensive revision process overseen by the BVIC IC Rules Amendment Committee. Uh, so our guest today was part of that committee. Uh, with an extensive experience in international arbitration and a substantial practice in Asia and in Europe, she is educated in both the civil law and the common law system and she is admitted to the Paris Bar and a, a solicitor in England and Wales. So prior to launching her career as an independent arbitrator, she practiced international arbitration at Sherman and Sterling in London. Thereafter, she joined the London Court of International Arbitration as counsel overseeing the arbitration of over 200 arbitrations. In 2014, she moved to Singapore, where she joined the arbitration chambers and was appointed tribunal secretary to over 80 arbitral tribunals under all major arbitral institutions, as well as ad hoc arbitrations. As adjunct pro professor, she teaches international arbitration at University of Tou Toulouse. Yep. One, did I say that right? Yeah. Yep. And regularly lectures at other leading institutions. She is now an independent arbitrator, door tenant at Fountain Court Chambers in London and Singapore and resident at the arbitration chambers in Singapore. She has served as arbitrator in arbitrations under the rules of the ICC, SIAC, LCIA, HKIC, KCAB and PCA, as well as in ad hoc arbitration. And as I told you, she was in the Rules Amendment Committee. She's, she's very, very familiar with the VVIIC rules and it was such a pleasure working with her on that project. Um, she also acted as arbitrator in expedited proceedings, and her experience spans a broad range of commercial disputes, including joint venture and shareholder disputes, fraud cases, construction and infrastructure projects, shipping, shipbuilding, heavy machinery, manufacturing agency and distrib distributorship agreements, hotel services, employment, sale of goods, and general contractual disputes. Now, please welcome. Christine Arteo. Welcome to Arbitration Life, Christine. How are you? It's so good to see you. Thank you very much, Hannah. Hi, Janet. Hi. Thank you for being here today. And uh, yeah, well, it's good to see you too. Good morning <laughs> to you. Yes. <laughs> Thanks in Singapore. Yeah, it's night time already. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just about to say. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, Christine, I'm going to get things started by asking you, how did you get your, your start in international arbitration? Did it choose you or did you choose it? Um, um, I would like to say I chose it, but I didn't. It kind of chose me. It chose, chose me. So um, when I went to law, when I started to study law, it was all about criminal law to me. So I had a passion for criminal law and I studied law for, to work in criminal law for seven years. Um, but then, and, and so I did, and I did, and I started for a few months in Paris and I studied that for seven years and I started to work in a criminal law practice in Paris. And then life decided otherwise. 
And quickly after we moved to London. And when we moved to London, I had an opportunity to work with Sherman and Sterling. And it happened to be in the dispute resolution group of Sherman and Sterling in the arbitration group. And so that's where I actually really well jumped on that opportunity and it was and, and I, I really liked it. And, uh, and the funny thing is when I was applying for all those master degrees in France for criminal law, on the side, I still applied, I remember now, I applied for a master in dispute resolution just in case I didn't get all those criminal law masters. And well, I did criminal law, but I ended up doing this future solution. So, you know, you don't always choose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the funny wow. thing also, you know, is um, it kind of circled back to what I wanted to do because when I started studying law, it was to become a judge. In criminal law, I wanted to do, but okay. it was the judge and so I ended up not doing criminal law doing dispute resolution but ended up being an arbitrator so that's that's quite funny yeah interesting <laughs> yeah thank you for Such an interesting story yeah mm-hmm. uh, so Christine having worked in arbitration in an institution and at firms what influenced your decision to become an independent arbitrator and how is this experience um I think it was you know it 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 didn't it wasn't with me as I said you know as I just started in private practice because I kind of discovered arbitration then and really enjoyed my years working in private practice discovering the world of dispute resolution and and you know the differences common law civil law when you study in in one country but then work in another but by the time I um, I was about to leave private practice and to join an institution. I think, you know, I I started to know much better and to start to get an idea of what I wanted to do. And when I worked in the institution at the LCIA in London, I think that's also when the idea of becoming an arbitrator became stronger and stronger, you know, in me. And then we moved to Singapore. And in Singapore... I didn't have, I mean, I didn't have a precise plan when we arrived here and I was just thinking, okay, what what are the options? That was about nine years ago in Singapore. So nine years ago, Singapore in terms of arbitration was not the same as today. It's crazy how it evolved in 10 years. Uh, But, you know, shall I go back to private practice? Shall I join an institution here, SISC? Or shall I do something else? And uh, I just wanted at that point in life, I just wanted to see the other seat. So I had seen the private practice, council, institution side. And so I wanted to see, okay, let's see if I can work for an arbitrator, see how they do it, if I like it, if I can do it. You know, like I I just wanted to kind of test myself and have another point of view. And um, uh, again, you know, 10 years ago, there weren't that many independent arbitrators in Singapore. But I was really lucky enough to, to meet uh, Lawrence Poo. And I told him about my plan. <laughs> and he was very supportive from day one. So that was quite um, amazing, quite an amazing experience. So I could start to work with different arbitrators, um, see different ways of doing things, see lots of, lots of different you know, cases run by different institutions, different subject matters, different styles, and um, and see that I liked it. <laughs> I liked it very much. And it really allowed me to also learn from different people, see different people's style and build my own, I think. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I learned a lot and then I started to get cases. And so that's how it came along and, and I, you know, got more and more cases and decided at some point to become a full-time arbitrator. Wow, thank you so much. It's so great how you had so many different perspectives uh, before becoming an arbitrator, actually. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. What would you say was one of the most defining moments for your career? Well, the one defining moment really is there was a one day Mm-hmm. Three years ago, a bit more than three years ago, where on that particular day, I joined as full-time arbitrator both the arbitration chambers in Singapore and Fountain Court chambers 
in London and Singapore. So, and, and all happened in one day. So that, I think that's quite, you know, defi one, one defining day. Um, uh, and that was really like reaching my goal and what I wanted to do. And, and so that's, that, that was quite amazing. But yeah, there were many defining moments, I think, that led me to this one. And I think when I moved to an institution and that really, as you say, Anna, it opened completely different perspective to working in private practice for five years then you just see arbitration from yeah from a completely different point of view and you and you learn totally different things when you've learned a lot in in private practice but in an institution you're exposed to completely different issues and you see all the law firms and all the arbitrators and and the procedural um, uh, complexity of the arbitrations and issues so that started to open, you know, some doors and I think that was quite defining. And then when we moved to Singapore and when I started to work as tribunal secretary again, that was really a, a turn in my, in my career, I think. Um, and moving to Singapore also because, I mean, Singapore was and has been during those uh, nine years such a supportive environment in terms of, you know, when you want to develop your, your career in arbitration, it's, 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 it's a really good place. To be in. Yeah. Thank awesome. you so much, Christine. Um, and now I will ask you what setbacks or difficulties have you experienced uh, during your career and how did you overcome them? Um, I, uh, I wouldn't think of anything as really setbacks. Uh, more, you know, difficulties. Difficulties were the different moves, probably, because it was kind of a family decision. Um, and so every time you have to bounce back and to adapt and to adapt to, to lots of different things, not only could be control, could be the language, could be, uh, you know, just the community getting... When I moved to Singapore, I didn't know a single person in Singapore. So, you know, you have... And I had been in London for 10 years where I knew the entire arbitration community and I was really happy there. And then arriving in Singapore, you have to rebuild all of that. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's not a difficulty. It's not a setback. It's just another challenge, but from which you come back, you know, stronger and it's even better after that. But I think the most probably difficult years, I would say for me, were probably my first three, three plus years in Singapore, because um, when I started to work here at the arbitration chambers, I worked for very busy arbitrators. So it was already a more than full-time job, if I can say. And, but at that time I had set my mind also on my goal and on what I wanted to do for myself and where I wanted to be in a few years time. And so I didn't want to compromise on that. So at that time, I was working for those arbitrators and I started to also teach arbitration, building classes, courses from scratch. I wanted to meet the community. I started with, with Singapore, then I went to Hong Kong as much as I could uh, to attend conferences, to speak at conferences. So I just wanted to do it all. I didn't want to compromise on my personal development uh, and on my job as tribunal secretary and for the arbitrator I was working for. So I think for over three years, I was probably working seven days a week and, and I don't know, 15, 17, 18 hours a day. And that, yeah, that was a lot. Um, I felt it was even probably more than when I was in private practice uh, or maybe just because I was older. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, it was you know, more. It was more. <laughs> it was more. <laughs> um, yeah, so it was um, it was challenging, but so rewarding at the end. Thank Christine, you. So much. Yeah, as you reflect on your career journey, do you think that you had any? Were there any expectations that you had about your career path that perhaps deferred from reality? Um, well, I think if you had asked me when I was like 18, 20, 20, you know, like back in the south of France at uni studying right. criminal law and thinking I'm going to be a judge in France, 
<laughs> I don't think I would have pictured myself working in Singapore, you know, like 15 or 20 years later as an arbitrator. So I think that's, that's yeah, kind of different from what I would have thought, you know, when I was younger. Um, I, after, yeah, well, actually, I was about to say after my institutional experience, maybe it was more kind of, you know, I knew what I wanted to do. So kind of going through that path, uh, pushing through it, you know, but actually when I was in London, I don't think I imagine going and living in Singapore and, and, and even less for, you know, 10 years. So, yeah. Uh, you know, you've got some expectations and you need to adapt then. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 I think that's the key. Adapting to yeah. what life throws your way. Exactly. Thank you so much. Christine, so you mentioned earlier um, creating courses from scratch. And I wanted to ask you in what way uh, your experience as an arbitrator has influenced the way you teach. Well, I've got much more horror stories to tell my students, for sure. Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know, <laughs> anecdotes and horrible things that can happen in cases. Um, uh, I probably also... Uh, well, it's uh, give more case studies and, and, and that, that probably uh, makes uh, the classes more interesting for them. It's more practical, certainly more practical. Also, um, I think what I can bring is, well, the arbitrator's perspective in the sense that most of those students want to be lawyers and it is so important for lawyers to keep in mind when preparing their submissions or anything in an arbitration that they do that to help the tribunal. And, and I think most of them just forget about that or don't really think about that because they are really focused on helping their clients. Yeah. and on doing a good job for their clients and for their supervisors or, you know. So I think it's really important to, to, to remind them that the end game is to convince, you know, the tribunal you have in front of you. So to listen to the tribunal and to, to make sure that that's, that's really kept in your mind at all times. Absolutely, thank you. Christine, I, I know we talked about kind of accepting what life throws your way and you know you know accepting the fact that your original aspiration was to be a judge and here you are right um but if you could go back and do anything differently on this career path would you change anything i don't think so actually you don't think so. <laughs> yeah that's that's, that's pretty <laughs> great i would say <laughs> but yeah no I don't think so because, I mean, you know, there were there were a tough moments, certainly yeah. tough years, certainly as well. But I think all of that um, made me the arbitrator I am today. So you know, I studied in France for seven years, and I'm clearly French. You can tell, <laughs> and so I'm, I'm from a civil law background. Um, but then I worked in common law countries, first in an American law firm with Americans and, you know, a certain culture to then move to a very British institution and then move to Asia. And, and you know, uh, and I think it just makes, even though there are some difficult times um, and working hard through that, it makes me the person I am today and, and having some, you know, awareness of different cultures and legal cultures and legal backgrounds so and and it's really interesting yeah well thank you for sharing that christine i think you have a remarkable career journey that you've shared with us so far and i'm i'm sure that younger arbitrators or practitioners listening will be truly inspired so thank you thank you very much very thank you. You. they will be inspired and to follow up on that what advice would you give them, the students and lawyers who are interested in having an international arbitration career? Um, um, I think, okay, number one that comes to mind would be uh, having a mentor. So mm -hmm. having someone, at least one person, could be, could be more, uh, but someone who you really look up to and 
who can be there for you and look after you, but then don't take this for granted and don't disappoint, you know, <laughs> work hard and show that be that person that, you know, you're really playing game and 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 doing what you've got to do to, to get where you want to go. Um, I would also say that it's it's really nice to have support in your not I mean I'm thinking in your community so not not take your colleague as your colleagues as competition uh, it's it's really nice to support each other and especially long for young lawyers they work really long hours it's it can be really tough and it's nice to have friends around instead of thinking that those people all around you are competition and that you you know you should keep away from each other uh, but it's a, it's not only your colleagues but your family I mean you know I'm where I am today certainly certainly uh, also with the support and thanks to the support of my husband so to have somebody that will be there for you when you can't do it anymore when it's been so much when you're ready to give up and gives you you know that little push to that little encouragement that enables you to to push through, to, to manage to continue and to, 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 to go through that. Um, and then I would say that, I mean, you know, the, the, the first advice that's always given to young lawyers is work hard, work hard, work hard. And of course, I mean, it's kind of a given, but it's not only work hard, is also don't compromise on the rest because especially in arbitration um, networking being known being seen is, is so important and if you're locked up in your office 24 hours seven days a week and nobody knows you after when you wake up after 10 years it's 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 going to be difficult to, to 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 come into the market right so i think if you can still, after those long hours, go the extra mile by, by going to conferences, by meeting people in institutions or just people, arbitrators or the lawyers, um, publish maybe if it's your thing, you know, just get your name out there and get yourself out there. I think it's, um, it's kind of crucial as well. Thank you so much, Christine. I love how you mentioned mentoring and networking. Uh, and this is something we talked about, Janet, during our uh, arbitral women event on diversity. Yes, 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 yes. I think this that's something yeah. we can never talk enough about, enough about, reminding people exactly. about the importance of networking. Yeah. Yeah. Networking, mentorship always. But I think my one of my, uh, I, I think which something that I think is a great advice is to say don't compromise. You have your plan and you don't compromise and you go for it. And this is a... Yeah. So it could it could be tough at some point, you know, because you want you want it all, you want it all, and you need to still do your job and do it well. Again, if you don't do it well, what's left of your reputation, you know? So you need you cannot compromise on that, but you shouldn't compromise on your other goals, your your personal, you know, aim. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So Christina, we have a bonus question for you. Oh, music, yeah. music, music is the international language. So we're curious to know what is your favorite song right now that's perhaps getting you through the day? <laughs> you have a okay. theme song. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, again, that's a special for my husband then, I think. <laughs> uh, he's been making fun of me a lot lately because <laughs> I'm, I'm in my Guns N' Roses phase. Okay. <laughs> And he kind of tells me that I, I missed it 20 years ago when it was actually, you know, everybody's face. So I'm, I'm, I'm a Guns N' Roses person at the moment. Okay. <laughs> Going through that, yes. What uh, song? It, what song? What song? Yeah, and and uh, well, the best song will be November Rain for me. I'm, I've been uh -huh. listening to that song a lot lately. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not ashamed to say, yeah, yeah. It's a good one. It's a really good one. Even it's 20, years, one. 20 yeah. years later, Only it's a good one. <laughs> exactly all right so thank you so much for sharing christine thank you for joining us in arbitration life it has indeed been a pleasure to get to know you i really appreciate this time um and that's all we have for today well thank you so much janet and hannah thank you for having me it was really thank nice you so much, christine thank you thank see you. you soon bye bye, bye.
All right. So I just want to thank Christine one more time for taking time out of her busy schedule for joining us on Arbitration Life. Uh, that was such a great interview. Yes. Uh, okay. And now for more Arbitration Life, please be sure to hit the subscribe button and to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Arbitration Life. Indeed. Thank you.